Coming up on Just Elders Podcast. There's no greater independent pod out right now. I'm cool with brother giving us opinion on brothers because you a brother, you understand the brother experience. But then when you start leaning over to the sisters, I'm like, ah, I, I want to hear from them. And I'm so proud of you. Thank you. That's right. I saw you when you didn't have a lock anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Permission to okay. speak freely. All right. And so let's talk about the music. I was raised in a gay household. One day I looked under the bedroom, the crack under the door. <laughs> Your bed. <Wow>. Ass. <laughs> <laughs> when I got 18, I ran, you know, 18 years old, but then I got pregnant at 19. But with Short all of run. that. <laughs> <laughs> And I did, like I told you, I promised myself I was going to do it one time and I won't do it again. But for me, <laughs> for one, me. Can I get uh, one shot, please? <laughs> yes. <laughs> can I get one puff, please? So, <laughs> no, oh, period. No. You don't do no. that. Those no, no, were no, no, fighting no. words. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, I am actually a, um, a victim of being. Women, young women. They have to learn how to co-parent. Yeah. I don't see money. I don't want to talk to him. Right. But see, the problem is, that's the problem. Now, that's the problem. Uh, back in the day, if you waited till you were 30, you were considered an old maid. Oh, that's still the You had to get married. Actually, I met him when I was two months pregnant. Oh, you a bad mama child. Oh, let, me do, let me just put this out there. You a bad. You a bad. <laughs> and you fucking. <laughs> I see. I was in the package store. And I was. <laughs> so I was. <laughs> he was 19 years younger. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling you all the rest of that. <laughs> Find out the rest on Patreon. <laughs> Subscribe to Patreon. And he was on the other side of midnight. What you mean? Well, he said that thing in between your legs, <laughs> if he wanted everybody to have it, He'd put it on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> if you go around bumping all day, anyway. <laughs> backhead bouncing in. <laughs> Thank Stories you so matter, man. Right. Experiences matter. Uh, black voices matter. <clears throat> ready? Born ready. It's Wednesday. <laughs> it's time for your favorite podcast, the favorite podcast. Today I got a good one, y'all. We're coming in to the queen because I got some beautiful black queens in the building. This is only for grown women right here. This is the grown Man, woman episode. Stop playing with me. What? Hey, do me a favor. Turn this up. Just ride with me for a minute. Tell your mama, mama, and your cousin, cousin, your auntie, auntie to turn it up. The Just Love It podcast is on. What it is, y'all. What it is. Hey, can y'all believe Aretha was not on the streaming platforms for a minute? She's back. What it is. What it is. This is what it is. We're going to do it just like this. What's up, family? It's your boy, Eldridge. You are tuned in to the Just Eldridge podcast, the hottest podcast to ever hit the airways. I am super excited. We're about to record the greatest episode we have ever recorded. I say it every time, and I mean it every single time. Round of applause, round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every last person that tuned in to last week's episode. As always, it is good vibes. It's good energy. Um, I love what we're doing here. I love my team. I love my fans. Um, speaking of fans, I got a review I want to read real fast before we get started. Uh, this review says, 
You can't miss an episode. That's the title of the review. There's no greater independent pod out right now. Not only do these guys find a way every week to keep us entertained, I am blown away by their efforts to uplift, inspire, and authentically share their own truths. Damn. Every guest on the show brings new light and something to discuss at the dinner table. This is one of one. Round of applause, please. Round of applause. Please. I mean... Man. This is this is episode 172, you know, so I am proud to say for 172 weeks in a row, we have brought y'all authentic, real content for the people. And uh, we ain't going to stop. Today is going to be even better. Um, if you know, back in the day, we used to always talk about how we would get our subjects. And we used to say the pod guys would bless us with subjects to talk about. And um, if y'all remember, episode... Um, I believe that was 170, um, old black man energy. <laughs> That's what it was. Old, old black man energy was the name of the episode. It was with Brother Jihad. And Shout he, out, Brother Jihad. Brother Jihad, Brother we Jihad. love you. We love you, brother. Yes, sir. But, you know, he was just very opinionated. You know what old, you know what old men do? You know, very opinionated old man and just giving us all his opinions. And I'm cool with brother giving us opinion on... Grumpy. Um, yeah, grumpy. I'm cool with brother giving us opinion on brothers because you a brother. You understand the brother experience. But then when you start leaning over to the sisters, I'm like, ah, I, I want to hear from them. And I want to hear specifically from sisters of his era. You know what I'm saying? We hear from the young ladies all the time. And I'll, I feel like we don't give our seasoned queens enough platforms to talk that talk. And uh, that's what this is today. So if you are on YouTube, you see these two beautiful, lovely guests. I'm about to invite them on the microphone Damn. right now. I do want to say thank y'all. Y'all didn't even say nothing. Most folk be on the mic just talking. Y'all waited for me to bring y'all on. See, y'all, y'all pop. Per perfect guests, professional, perfect. professional, professional. Uh, I'm gonna start uh, left to right. This first young lady, man. Where do I begin? Pre locks. Uh, <laughs> When I first moved, I ain't had locks when I first met you. I first moved to uh, Georgia. Matter of fact, I was living with Mr. Griffin. Not made man. <laughs> made, made man. <laughs> Reynolds Town, the maid organization. I'm in Reynolds Town. There's a community center in Reynolds Town. And if you wanted to do anything at the uh, community center, you had to talk to the queen. And the queen is sitting right here. It's Miss Jean Hudley, one of the most hardest working committed sisters to our people, specifically our young men, the founder, CEO, creator of Boys to Men, now rebranded Boys to Men and Girls to Win. Y'all give it up to Miss Jean Hudley. How you doing, baby? I'm doing fine, Eldridge. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I appreciate this opportunity and I'm so proud of you. Thank you. That's right. I saw you when you didn't have a lock anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm happy to be here and and hope that I can share something with our audience that could help take them to the next level. I believe that. I believe that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next to the microphone, uh, this young lady, you know, we say you meet some people and you have kindred spirits. So like we know each other for a long time. And it hasn't been that long, but it feel like it's been forever. Um, we were headed to South Africa, the DB Africa trip. And uh, we had to do something with, it was a whole bunch of hoops you had jumped through with COVID-19 and your uh, VAX cards and stuff. And I was just helping people get their stuff together. Met this sister, and she said she's coming on a trip. Good personality, good energy. And it's my job. I said, look, it's my job to make sure you have a good time. If you don't have a good time, it's my fault. And we had a blast on that trip. So we was in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, all over. Um, this is my new friend, also a community advocate, has an amazing organization. Uh, we recently just did some work together a few days ago, helping the family. Uh, Y'all give it up for my very, very beautiful, intelligent friend, Miss Alicia Washington. Thank you, Andres. I just appreciate the fact that you allowed me to come on to this show, and I pray that I'm able to give some of my wisdom uh, to some of the people concerning the things that we've been through. Yeah, we definitely get it to it. But look, I'm going to tell y'all now, I don't want all 
We this like how we talk. Y'all know we friends now. So right. don't, don't get all off. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want none of that today. Indubitably. I don't want none of that. I, I want to have a real conversation. And we're going to talk about everything. So uh, let's get to it. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Miss Jean. Where you from, man? Uh, talk to me about the genesis. Where you from? Well, I'm from New York City. New York in the building. New York. You lost your accent. Kept your attitude. Though. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm from New York City, born in Harlem Hospital, raised in the Bronx. Nice. And I've been here 40 years. Nice. I brought my three kids here. Um, and happy to be here. Um, it was a transition. Hmm. Um, it was... A, a, a stepping out of the box movement. Right. And um, I'm glad that I did it. You know, I realized as I matured that God does things his own way. And I thought I was coming here to give my kids a better chance at life. And I don't think that that was wrong, but I think the bigger picture was to help somebody and and boys to men uh, evolved out of that move. Nice. Now, married, unmarried? Uh, I am single. And single. Okay, cool. Were you ever married before? Yes, I've been married three times. What? Damn. Oh, so Watch you, that. You about to, nah, you about to bring some, you about to bring some, you about to bring some game. You young girl struggling to get one time. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> the ring snatcher. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I, I, I've never had any problems getting married. Um, it's um, you gonna bottle that and sell that right there. <laughs> it's um, uh, selecting the right spouse and I think um I think you really have to live a while before you know about making correct choices right. in a relationship I don't think it's anything that you learn early on I think that um when two people come together they they have to be willing to do what it takes to stay together right and everybody's not willing to do that. And so then you have to learn how to be alone. Hmm. And I've learned how to do that. I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. At least we're going to go to you. Where you from, baby? Kids, all that. I'm originally from Chicago. Um, I've been here since oh, 1999. Shut, I actually was born and raised and raised my children in Chicago. Um, I oh, have so you the five, real Chicago. Yeah, I have five children. I live normally people will ask you what side of town do you live on? I've actually lived on all sides. I was born and raised on the south side, but I've lived on the west side, east side, not so much the north. But uh that's why I raised my children. I didn't really come to Georgia wanting to come. Uh actually my brother got sick and I wanted to relocate to take care of him. And it all transpired because I, I've only been married once. And I didn't marry anymore only because I had such a traumatic uh, experience from 19 to 27 that I went through a lot of different experiences where I just wasn't um, comfortable with just saying um, I want to marry again and again. I had the opportunities to and had plenty of men to do it with. So I never oh, had talk that. that talk. <laughs> talk, talk that talk. Talk that talk, goddamn. I never had a problem. I, she, I ain't I, lacking no niggas. I never had that problem. <laughs> Even if it was just what? one thing, and that one thing is sexual. Well, let's be real. Okay, so I lived in an age of the 70s where sexuality was booming. You know, everybody know James Brown. It's your thing. Do what you want. You know, hot pants and all of that was real back then. So uh, one thing that... Uh, that's the era I lived in, naturals, you know, all of what you all do now, you know, we've been there, done that, and so. Talk but, that, um, talk. <laughs> so, Dang. it's, uh, Dang. one side, my marriage did not work. Um, that was at age, about age 30, 31. By that time, I had already had five kids, 
And um, I just turned my life to God because I, my experiences just really pushed me to my relationship with God. And from that point of age 30, 31, being a single mother, raising my children in Chicago, relocating to Atlanta in 1999, I've been here officially 22 years. Uh, out of that, I'll never forget when my brother was uh, sick, the Lord really revealed the organization, which I do have a nonprofit. It's uh, called the City of Hope Safe Haven. And it didn't come from me, it actually came from God, and it came from my experiences. And I used to ask God all the time, why did I go through, what did I go through, what I went through? Even though I went through them, and I was victorious at the end of them, you still wonder why you went through it. If there was choices or whatever, you're still trying to figure that out as you get older. But um, going for it, I did have the uh, organization, and it was birthed through God. Um, my experiences birthed through that. And all the way up to now, I'm here. And um, I, I'm glad I'm here. I wasn't, didn't really want to be here because Chicago and Georgia just wasn't, they, it was like it, night and day. Didn't. Like, where is there somewhere to eat at 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock at night? Uh, nowhere but Waffle House, you know, uh, going down the street, driving down the street. That's right, you moved to Lithonia. That's down the, <laughs> <laughs> Driving down the street, no sidewalks, no lights. It was a, it you was can't traumatic for me. You can to Chicago. You got to do it night Atlanta. and day. I'm telling you, it was <laughs> night and day, and I wanted to go back. And because I'm obedient to what God says and have for me to do, I stayed. And I'm glad. I'm glad I did. It all worked out for not only for me but for my children also. That's what's up. Round of applause. Round of applause. Thank. First of all, I love how both of y'all one didn't necessarily intend to come here, but when you got here, you accepted your calling to help, you know what I'm saying, your people. That's a beautiful thing. Um, let's talk about something. You went, you said earlier, you were like, you come from that era, the seventies and, you know, James Brown and, you know, sexuality, natural, y'all, everything we doing there, y'all been there, done that. Um, there's so many conversations that you hear. Ooh, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> y'all came from that area, right? there. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, so, you know, this the era that I grew up listening to. I, I this all I know, but like, what do y'all see the difference now? Cause you just said it. That was the music back then. It was all about sexuality then. The music now is about sexuality. What do you see the difference between what's happening now and what y'all went through back then? You can play something. Where, where you going with it, Keith? See this this our hot pants right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, <laughs> this, uh, no. <laughs> so look, New York girls are doing it too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> look, look, look! That's the hot pants right there. Hey, 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 hey! What? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's, what's the difference? What's the difference now? Well, and, and let's have a real conversation because y'all okay. did it back then. Okay. We doing it now. What's the difference okay. between the young ladies? Because I ain't going to talk to the young lady. I'm going to let y'all talk to them. Okay. Um, <laughs> Permission to okay. speak freely. All right. And so let's talk about the music. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> the music... Um, Focus on love songs, and you know uh, uh, there was some there was some sexual references, um, like um, "Just Let Me Make Love to You, Baby," mm -hmm. yeah. okay, by the OJ's. That was one of my favorites. That was your, that was your shit, boy. What? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> However. During that period of time, you did not hear vocalists referring to sexual acts. Mm. There mean? was there was nobody talking about sucking on a wiener, you know, what a person's behind look like. <clears throat> oh no, they didn't do that. Even it's, Rick James. Listen, Rick James was an exception to the rule. <laughs> There's always an exception. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. um, 
and women did not have their behinds up on the screen, maybe because there wasn't one at the time. <laughs> but they were well. doing it. But, well, they they didn't do it the same way. No, sir. Okay. Um, uh, women seem to have more respect for themselves during that period of time. Mm -hmm. There were some boundaries, some lines that were drawn. Right. You did not see women walking down the street with their whole bosom hanging out. With their stomach, They even if they, their stomach looked like they 10 months pregnant, they still have a midriff top on. Um, and a pair of shorts that has the cheeks or they behind hanging out. They accept now, who, their body. Who is, is that? Body positivity. Who, I, who, I don't want to see it. Yeah, no, but, this I, I, but that, they want to accept the positive of their body. So they, no, they need to accept themselves. They, that's, their why body, put, that's why they put it their on. Body, their body is only the physical. Mm, okay. Speak they to need that. to have some kind of mental acceptance of themselves some kind of um, some kind of self respect of themselves now i want y'all to both answer this now you said women have boundaries and respect were there boundaries or were there just constraints they couldn't do it did they well, want to do it and they couldn't i don't i don't think that they wanted to do it it wasn't anything that was um so you never felt in your timeline both y'all can answer that y'all never felt constrained by like social standards of women and how they should be based on what you wanted to do versus what you wanted to do. There are social standards everywhere in life. Right. Okay. So it didn't just happen then, you know, like, um, I'll give you an example. Um, I was raised in a gay household. My mother was gay. Okay. okay? <clears throat> now my mother was the femme in the family. Okay. Okay. And fan for those, she was Fem. more feminine. She was the feminine. She was the lady. Okay. What's her? Her uh, friend. Her friend. Um. Uh, was the butch? They called them butches then. Butch. Right. Butches. That was the common term. But they did not wear men's clothing. They didn't wear men's clothing. They did not dress like men. Oh, neither one of them? The no. femme nor the butch? No. Mm. No. They wore, the butch wore conservative clothing. You know, they still wore, they wore uh, maybe two-piece suits. They wore like the loafers. Suits. Yeah. Mm, okay. Or, okay. or skirts. Mm. They wore skirts. They didn't cut all their hair off. They weren't trying to look like a man because they weren't attracted to men. But did they want to do that? No, I don't believe so. Because I do remember, um, and I don't know how this happened, I do remember being around a party that they had. Mm -hmm. And the the butches still were very conservative. Right. Now, true enough, that true. wasn't a popular uh, a lifestyle to live in the 1950s or 60s. You didn't, you didn't walk around with a flag, you know, and telling everybody that you were gay. I'm going to tell you something else. I never remember seeing my mother in the bed, although they had a bedroom and the door was closed when they went in there. But I never remember seeing them in the bed. I never remember seeing them embrace, embrace in any kind of way. And they were kissed in front of you. No, 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 never, never. <laughs> my mother. How you knew she was gay just, because I, I well, her <laughs> because one day I looked under the bedroom, the crack under the door. Your bed. Wow. Ass. <laughs> <laughs> Your bed no, really, she's supposed to be doing. <laughs> and I don't know what made me look under there, and I really didn't understand what I was looking at because I was about ten. 
Mm. But I understood it later later on in life. Right, what it was. At and, least. Yeah. And, and ju I just want to make one other point. My mother always said to me, I want grandchildren. Mm. She never pushed me to live the life that she lived. Mm. And she was very, again, uh, meticulous about the way she behaved as far as her friend was concerned in front of us, me and my sister. So um, that was my experience. Mm. Alicia, what about you? What do you, um, did you see the, I guess the original question is like things that y'all did back then, behavior, was it because that's just what y'all wanted to do or was it based off of these are constraints we had? Well, number one, I ran from the constraints. There were some, there were a lot. Like what? You know, um, I couldn't dance. I couldn't listen to the worldly music because I was brought up in a oh, Christian a household. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. Uh, my mom brought us up in an African and Methodist Episcopal church. And so we went to church like seven days a week. Y'all go to hell for <laughs> I everything. I mean, you know, like, so when I <laughs> made son of a preacher, 18, man. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> when I got 18, I ran, you know, 18 years old, but then I got pregnant at 19. But with short all of run. that. <laughs> short, short run. God Very damn. short, okay. But uh, I was running on gotcha, the time, right? actually. <laughs> I was always running from that. So for me, it was a lot of constraints in my family household. Um, rules, of course, things you don't do as a Christian young lady, right? So I ran from all of that. And I had one thing that I always said. I said, if I do it one time and never, ever do it again, I'm going to do it. And that was my mindset because I was in a household where we couldn't play in the front. You couldn't listen to the music like Aretha Franklin, Marvin Gaye, okay. however, Mary, I couldn't listen to any of that. So we were downstairs, me and my sisters and my brothers downstairs, just sneaking, always sneaking. So for me, I ran away from all of the things that controlled me. Right. And I always considered my household as a controlling household, real strict, my household. Now, I thank my mother for the strictness that helped restrain me but it didn't keep me from going out there i did go out and i did like i told you i promised myself i was going to do it one time and i won't do it again but for me for one, me can the, i get one shot please <laughs> yes can i get one puff please so <laughs> i uh as far as the clothing i was really out there with the clothing I have to I have to admit that. And when I look What's at the out, girls, I, I'm sorry, I want to know what's out there for y'all. No, I was what was out what there? Was out yeah, there? well, pretty much you all have repeated everything that we did. Okay, like the midriffs, the mm. short short tops. We mm. did that. Two piece. Uh -huh. Um, two piece. Well, mm. at, the back bikinis. then they had. I think the the, the the dresses were short, and you. But the point of they had back then, you had the little panties to match the dress. Okay, so they had the little. Uh, uh, shorts that mm -hmm. would go up under him. So no matter how short it was, you even if you bent over, you still had the little shorts and mm. you could see that. Right. So they yeah, had a they little bit no more, more class about yeah, they, what you they, wore they back then than what they're wearing now. <laughs> and so I have to say I was a little a lot wilder. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little wilder. Now one thing we never did, we never accepted the term bitch, period. Not you could not, each no, oh, period. No. You don't do no. that. Those no, no, were no, fighting no. words. Yeah. And right, that right, turns right. me off when I see young bitch. ladies like, accept yeah. the yeah. term yeah. bitch. It just, no, we didn't play that. We didn't play that. We didn't that. And talk so, about so, your mama. So when did it, we didn't when play did it, that. When did it come in? Like, when did y'all first start hearing, like, hold on, everybody, the oh, young girls saying each other. other. Well, first of all, I hear them really well all the time on the rap. The, the men would rap, mm. and you hear mm. them refer to women yes. as bitches, right? Mm. And so then it seemed like it streamed over to the women yeah. and the girls that now you have to That's accept true. the fact that you're called a bitch and accept it. So then I started mm. seeing girls having it on their butts, having it on their shirts, and they're walking around proud of it. You mm. know, I'm a bitch. The yeah, baddest I'm a bitch. bitch. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, bad. yeah so the baddest bitch. Yeah. I, that was never been, you know, disrespect for the women was still there. The uh, the morality part, mm -hmm. it was there and it was firm. And so then, what, what what would they say back then instead of this? Or how was it? Different what was the, like, what was the okay? So if if a young man got mad with you, mm -hmm. 
and you said something or did something that he didn't like, he'd call you. He he would call you out your name, a hoe, okay. a whore, or a yeah, B, or a B. And so those were fighting words. My okay. point is, I never accepted that term for myself. Where the young ladies of today accept that as a, mm. a shiny <laughs> metal yeah. on their dads. They wear it on their shirts. They, so, right. Yeah. Their shirts, their butts. I've seen it everywhere, you know. Yeah, and so that was like that, that was not something that we accepted. To- total disrespect for the woman. Total. And I don't accept it. You know, I watch it and everything. Now, as far as the dressing, I totally agree with her. Um, I had, uh, I did wear um, garments that uh, that they're wearing now. I've never been a big person, so, you know, my stuff is always intact. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I just uh, did it for attention. And, and, and you have to look at it until you learn to do better. You're going to do what you see. Okay, I, so. I, so. I got a question. I got a question. And we both just got it at the same time. This was yeah. over 72 episodes to do for you. Yeah, uh, so, what, um, what do you think y'all would do with social media back then? Because you just said you did it for attention. And you got to think about these young girls. Like, you did it for the attention. No, no, they tell us it's not for attention. We tell them it's clearly for attention. No, like, you're wearing a sheer shirt right. showing your nipples, right. and you're telling me you're doing it because you so just right. want to? Right. You yeah. want some attention. You want some, right. we know, we know but I appreciate you saying, no, I put that on for attention. Right. But So imagine, like, I can imagine it, you put it on, like, at any given day, right, you, would, mm-hmm. you probably encounter, what, less than 100 men? You know, mm-hmm. as far as just throughout your day wearing what you're wearing. Mm-hmm. Imagine hundreds and thousands of men giving you comments, mm-hmm. likes, yeah, yeah. At, at, in in hours and seconds. You know what I'm saying? Right. What do you think that would have did I'm about to y'all? say, well, hours, me, minutes. I, I, yeah. I, that I story was posted uh, a minute ago. Right. <laughs> I definitely would, as far as I'm concerned, I am actually a, um, a victim of being raped. So um, I would tell people, uh, young ladies, you know, that that's not a good thing, you know, because the attention that you draw, you you can't control the con- attention that you draw. None of it is positive. OK, but a lot of times the attention that they want, it all stems from their story. You will never know why they do what they do and the reason why they do what they do until you hear their story, their background, what they were brought, how they were brought up, where's the father in their family. Did their father tell them they're queens and king? You know, um, guys, did your dad tell you you're a king? You know, you this, that. And you know, if you don't hear that, when you get out, then you want someone to tell you that in your ear. Was that and your so, experience? Um, yes, it was. My dad was an excellent uh, provider. Mm-hmm. But other than that, we had no relationship at all. Mm-hmm. You know, so I went out seeking attention, seeking for someone to tell me all of the things that I want to hear that I should have heard from my father. I got it. I got it. Um, what you, well, I wanted to ask you about your father because you spoke about your mother and a friend. What, what about your father? What was your experience? I didn't meet him until I was 17. Mm. And I had had my first child. I had him when I was 17. And my mom, I don't know... Uh, all of a sudden, for some reason, she thought it was necessary for me to meet him. So she found him. And um, where he was at? Cross Street. Are you stupid? <laughs> <laughs> you know, back then they would say stuff like that. I heard a lot of stories. They were right up the street. Let me go find this nigga. <laughs> Your daughter out here. You so crazy, boy. <laughs> no, no. Um, actually. He was he was down in Harlem. I was in the Bronx. Mm. And um, uptown. Yeah, I was uptown. Mm. Yeah. And he um it was crazy because when he came to the door, looking at him was like looking in a mirror. Wow. I I looked so much like him. And we we must have stood there and cried about 20 minutes. We never did. It took us 20 minutes to get in the house. Um, and so it, it was crazy. I mean, because they had this, their story also, you know, and, and I, I was like, um, how do you, 
I don't understand how you have a child that you don't look for. You know, how, how do you conceive a child, know that they're um, alive, and don't look for them? But I learned through my own experience that women, whether, whether you are uh, heterosexual or gay, and parents, they have a tremendous effect on why children don't have relationships with their fathers. Well, that's a uh, that's a take right there. You want to go deeper into that? Um, yes, sir. Uh, because a lot of women, uh, uh, because they don't make it with an individual, and generally, if it's not because of any kind of abuse against the child okay mm -hmm. if they don't make it with a guy and they see that he goes on with his life and makes it with someone else they resent it and they uh they come between them and their children so their their feeling is is that because you didn't make it with me um, I'm not going to allow you to have a relationship with the child, which is has been so damaging. <clears throat> so let me ask you this. What advice would you give uh, women, younger women during this time how to navigate with, quote, unquote, baby daddies? Because it sounds like baby daddy's been around yes, since a long the 50s, 60s, long time. A long time. Right. But you said something about being able to separate the two, saying, like, hey, this right. is for your child. This is your relationship, but right. how what, we have what, to but learn. what do you do when these guys say they're not taking care of the children or not paying the child support, not doing what the system is requiring them to do? Well, I think I think that is a twofold issue. Okay, because I think that um women, young women, they have to learn how to co parent. Hmm. I mean, they have to they have to be willing to sit down with uh, the father of their children and talk about ways they can make this a successful rearing um, experience, okay? I'm not sitting down with him until he sends some money. Yeah. I don't see money. I don't want to talk to him. Right, but see, the problem is, that's the problem. Mm. Now, that's the problem because what a lot of uh, young people don't understand is that a child a child wants a relationship with their father yeah. and we have to learn how to build relationships mm -hmm. and then there won't be a problem about getting any money mm -hmm. but if you're just asking for money <laughs> and you don't you don't want a relationship with me and my child or for me and my child that is part of that's the elephant in the room. It's like extortion. Yes, mm, mm, mm. that that that's what it is. Mm. I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can we talk about um? Both of y'all said y'all been married. The process of getting married back then versus now. Um, and you you hear it, it's twofold. Let me just say this: we do hear a lot of millennials now are getting married. Um, the tide is turning and we're starting to hear a little bit more of that. But you also hear a lot of stuff say the dating process is horrible. It's trash, especially here in Atlanta. And getting married, but getting married later. You know, right. After the 30s, 30, 35, mm -hmm. right. even closer to 40. So it sounds like y'all. For the first marriage. So it sounds like you got married pretty early uh, in life. 19, you said? No, I got pregnant at 19. I got married at age 27. Okay. But uh, back in the day, if you waited till you were 30, you were considered an old maid. Oh, that's still the count. You had to get married. I think that's still, that's still true today. Nah. That's still true today, too, but it's, it's a different. So you progressively were doing what you had to do to make sure you didn't hit that 30 mark, you know, so that they won't call you an old maid. <laughs> but, but, but speak right? to it, though. Outside of being an old maid, what else? What made you an old maid? Well, no, not made it. Well, that was just maid. the terminology that they just yeah, used. Yeah, not, not made your old maid, but like, why was it so important crucial? for you to yeah, marry between? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That was 
the way that they thought back then. I think because even in the South, they were getting married. And I just found out as I started getting older and mingling with my older aunts and stuff, they were getting married at teenagers, like 15, 16, 17 years old. I actually were playing with them. They were married to someone. And I did not know they were teenagers, just like they were pretty much still kids. And they were married, you know. And so I guess because of that, the the way they were, you know, the way it was back then, mm-hmm. when you got to be 30, that was an over-the-hill thing, you right. know. So I'm just speculating because I wasn't forced to do it like that. But um, for me, marriage only came because of I, I got saved at that time. And I no longer wanted to live that lifestyle, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and that's what pushed me because the the Bible already had two children out of wedlock. So uh, the one at 19 and the other one at uh, 25. So when I got saved, which my experiences pushed me also to come to a certain place in my life that I needed to make some solid decisions about my life moving forward. And uh, when I got saved and and that's so important because when I told you I went to church all week long, it didn't play, the church didn't really play a lot, but having Jesus in my life did, you know, so the Bible does teach you train up a child in the way that he should go so that when he gets older, that he will not depart from it, right? So whatever parts that they taught me in church, which I felt like they weren't as effective as I I thought because Jesus was just like somebody in a storybook. Like, he does not know what I'm going through right now. You know, I'm going through this situation. What does he know about this? You know, like that's back in the day. And that's how I looked at him. But as time went on and I went on with my experiences, uh, I began to look at him in a whole different light. So I gave my life to the Lord at 27, only because the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn. So I knew I didn't want to cut out sex, bottom line. I just knew I didn't want to do that. You know, so the next thing to do is to do the right thing, and that was to marry. And so that's how I got to that dividing point of marriage versus. So for me, that's why I married well, I at 27. Married. Mm-hmm. So um, one, I can relate. Um, to growing up in the church, and I think the difference is when you. How about I say, Mary? <laughs> nah, nah. I'm just saying. <laughs> I've been burning for a long time. <laughs> hey, but look, so, so, so marrying, uh, marrying. I mean, go, doing church when you're young and when you grow up, it's like mm-hmm. you do church is something you do. Do you just do? You didn't right. really have the relationship. relationship when you get no. older. You start to understand, oh, Mm -hmm. this is what they mean when they say, if it had not Mm -hmm. been for the Lord by my side. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. I I appreciate those experiences, though. Like like you said, Mm -hmm. it plants those seeds. Yeah, it's seeds. It's seeds. Your mom, your grandma being those praying women for you. That's right, praying. Somebody prayed for you. you It's always that. You know, it's the seed, right? Life is the experiences, is the rain. Because sometimes rain, it feels bad. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's the rain. And those prayers of the sunshine, they and keep it, rain. make it all go together. So I definitely <laughs> understand you what you say. I grew up in the church, but I got saved at 27. I get that. How old were you when you first got married? Uh, your first husband? The first lucky winner? <laughs> um, Actually, I met him when I was two months pregnant mm. with, with uh, my eldest son. And, um, you know, I told him right away. Oh, you a bad mama child. Oh, let, me do, let me just put this out there. You a bad, you a bad mama. And now, I, now, I'm, now, I, now, I look, thought it was look, on Friday. Look, look, when I met I her, she not, had a little bump. I, I ain't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. Now, you know, everybody know I'm down to be a stepdad. But I got to at least meet the kid first. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Yeah, the picture. <laughs> oh Lord, Eldred Hush, you know. All right, All right, boom. So you meet him, you know what I'm saying? You're like, yeah. Oh, uh, sh- don't worry about this. You know, <laughs> few more months. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, keep going. We good to go. Keep going. No, uh, but when I met um, Irvin, he, um, you know, I-, I told him right away, and he was like, "What's what's yours is mine, and what's mine is yours." And what did married- you meet him? On the beach. I was about to say, what you had on? (laughs) (laughs) 
A two-piece bathing suit. Yeah. 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 Okay, you got, you out there sunbathing. <laughs> And, and, and was that was that normal? Was that just the brother's movement back then, or was Irv a, a, a different cat? He was um, he was a, a different kind of guy. Actually, I had seen Irvin when I was like twelve, and we lived in the same neighborhood in the Bronx. And we had the apartment that I lived in with my parents. The windows were all on the front of the building. So I would be looking out the window and I would see this guy coming down the street and I would say, ooh, he so is fine. And I was 12. 12 years old. I was, I was 12. <laughs> How old was looking he? Looking at, uh, Irvin was um, about nine years older than me. Okay. He okay. was about nine years old. I get it now. And so, um, <laughs> So when I met him on the beach, I was like, ooh, I'm 17 now. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> I'm 17 now. <laughs> and you fucking. <laughs> I see. Why you say it like that? Uh, uh, <laughs> and you making love. <laughs> you making love, baby. <laughs> You put it on your hot pants. So, <laughs> so yeah, and so um, we were together. We got married when my eldest son was eight months old. Oh. And I mean, we had we had a good marriage, but I had some really awful in laws. And when they found out that the baby wasn't, the baby his. wasn't his, yeah, 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 everything changed. And now, did he like tell, or did, was it always? I, no, I I told him okay. to tell okay. them. He didn't want to, and I said no. Yeah, because I would think he probably wouldn't even want to. He was, yeah, he, he said what yours is. That was mine, honorable so. of you, but at the same time, you probably should let him just go. Yeah, down. I I um. I mean, technically, it's here. He was there for the yeah. whole pregnancy. Yeah, and after. Yeah. You know, and after. Um, you regret letting him tell? No. Hmm. No. But, you know, all all of the people that spoke so badly about me, none of them are here. Hmm. Say that. I didn't wish him any ill but none of them are here. Mm. And when I moved here, some of them moved here behind me. Wow. So, you know, you have to be very careful about how you uh, tear people down because of their um, mistakes, bad choices, mm. especially early on in life, you know, you... You, um, we, we all make mistakes. I would have never known, never guessed in a million years that I would be doing what I'm doing. Um, so, and 17 and pregnant. So how, um, uh, how old was, um, uh, how long were you married versus how long were you married? Three years. Long, married for three years? Mm -hmm. How about you? I was married two. Two years. Cool. What made you, uh, what, how soon did you get your second husband? Um, let me see. Um, I was in Georgia. Okay. So, I don't know, maybe 20 years. Okay, 20 years later. So, you, yeah. Yeah, you really got used to being on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I was in a couple of long term relationships, mm -hmm. but I knew that they weren't marriage material. So, what made you do the second marriage if you was. 20 years later. Um he must have I really met, wild. I you. met I, I met a guy that was just um I just thought he was absolutely wonderful. Mm. And um he was, but he had a drug addiction. Mm. 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 I don't heard that before. And I was with him ten years. That's a hard one. Yeah. 
That's so he, you know, he just wasn't, <clears throat> he just wasn't willing to do what it took to, to be get here. clean and stay clean. Did, did it, it, that addiction occur before you met him or did it happen? It was before, before I met him. So didn't I, know I didn't it? know. Yeah, yeah. He had That's what I raps. heard. What, I don't yeah. heard other women with those experiences. They yeah. didn't know. I they're didn't functioning, know. They're functioning yeah. drug addicts. And then it's just hard. It's, yeah. Especially if kids are involved. Yeah. It's very hard. Yeah. And he um, he was the kindest man. He loved God. He could sing gospel and make you lay down on the floor. Mm. But the the right. addiction and and the pain, you know, that he was medicating, obviously um, would not allow him to do what he needed to do. And it obviously it soon it quickly it killed him about ten min- ten years later. Mm. So yeah. All right, I guess I'm interested. I yeah. didn't want to know the third time the charm. Uh-huh. How you get the third one? Um, I was. She <laughs> <laughs> left at that one. <laughs> Damn. I, I was in the package store, and I was. Uh, <laughs> so I was. <laughs> she went from the beach. <laughs> <laughs> And you're right because I went to buy some reefer when I met my second husband. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> not the reefer. No, we called it reefer. No, when yeah, he, yeah. he was the customer, not the owner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what you get? Oh, oh, look, I do reefer, not that right there. <laughs> Damn. So, no, when he walked up, the oh, man said, You no. want your regular? No, you know what? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But well, I was in the package store. I was going to a barbecue, and I went to get um, a, a bottle of Crown Royal. Okay, oh, okay, the purple bag. <laughs> purple bag. <laughs> do women say the bag like men do? Uh, uh yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Back in the day, you put your money. You used yeah. to save pennies and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It was the best favorite, bag. They tied on to their jeans, and it just yeah. me and, I'm in the, I know the young men would tie it on to their jeans and just wear it. It's just like a souvenir piece. Yeah, like, see, look, look, look. <laughs> even back in the day, just ties it. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I Cal, just don't bring can. that back, Cal. Cal, I'm about to bring that back. <laughs> I just kept them though, because I said I would use them as gift bags yeah. for men. Right, yeah, you know, right. but but um, and so I was I was walking through the package store looking on the shelves for this Crown Royal, and this guy. And I, now I had a cousin of mine visiting from Chicago, so she was in my car with one of my grandchildren. So I'm walking through the store. And I'm looking down, and when I look down, I see I'm getting ready to bump into this guy with these big feet. And I looked up at him, I said, I said, I am so sorry, please excuse me. He said, "Um, No, excuse me, (laughs) (laughs) ma'am. That's okay. He said, That's okay. I want to know who the lucky man is. And I said, well, I be looking at oh, game boy, game boy. That's a line. That's definitely a line. That's definitely a line for real. Who is the lucky said, man? Okay. And I said, um, well, if that's supposed to be a compliment, I thank you. And I walked around him. So I got to the other end of the package store, and when I looked, he was standing next to me again. And I was like, now this Negro, because he looked, I said, he thinks I got some money. Cause he was a lot younger than me. Uh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how many, how many years think, younger? He was 19 years younger. Yeah, he was 19 years younger than me. And um so he, you know, he says, um, I, I said, who 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 is the lucky man? I said, there isn't a lucky man. He said, Well then, um, can I have your phone number? I said, No, I'm not giving you my phone number. 
He said, well, why? He said, it ain't no lucky man. He said, I don't understand. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I said, how am I going to get this Negro out of my face? Give him the number. That's what I did. Because <laughs> I said that if he talk wrong, I know how to get rid of him. But I said to him, I said, well, give me your number. Mm. He said, well, I don't have no problem with that. He said, but just give me yours in case you, you don't lose call. mine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, take note, fellas. <laughs> take note. <laughs> <laughs> Quit accepting that Instagram shit. <laughs> and, um, Did and you we, call him we, first or he called you? No, he, he called me about an hour later. You know, y'all don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> he called me about an hour later, and I'm not telling y'all all the rest of that. So we can go here. That's all we need to know. <laughs> but, and the rest is a marriage. The rest exactly. is a hey, look, find out the rest on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to Patreon. <laughs> Uh, look, tell us this. Give some advice to the sisters now that's out here dating and they want to be married. Give some advice to them. What would, If y'all advice to help these young girls get their husband. Y'all done did it. Some of you done did it more than once. But I mean, I just think, I, you know what? Truthfully, I think the world of marriage. I would love to be married. Mm. Okay. I would love to be married, but... I want to be married and stay married. You know what I'm saying? So me loving to be married is, is not good in and of itself. The person that I'm going to marry needs to love to be married. married too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's real. And if you, if, if, and the signs, um, th there's a, a brother, his name is R.L. Blake. Are you all familiar with Blake? Uh, R.L. Blake. R.L. Blake has a women's ministry. Oh, he's he's awesome though. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got he's got a book called Queenology and one called Kingology. But he talks about the characteristics of a man who is really interested in a woman. R.C. Blake. R.C. Blake's right. <clears throat> You're right. And so I think a lot of these young girls need to listen to him hmm. because they obviously don't know. He's going to have to pay for is, this. Is, is he married? Yes, he is. And he was on the other side of midnight. What you mean? Well, uh, he just wasn't. I about he, was, he was burning up. I he was burning up like El, oh, like El. Oh, okay. I about to say that sounded gay. I about to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I about to say was he delivered? Like, yeah. We said other don't side of good That's how you know how to get a man. Don't y'all start no rumors. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. We, 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 that, that was no. just a euphemism yeah. I wasn't familiar right, with. Right. He's on the other side of midnight. No, no, That's no, not no. some shit you're doing in the dark. No. <laughs> so, say... So, so yeah. he used to be a but, player. Yeah. Okay. A yeah. player retired. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Because so, I saw the picture, I was like, oh. <laughs> Y'all are bad. <laughs> yeah. So he's been married, I think, 30 years now. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> and so he talks to women a lot about, you know, what they deserve, you know, what to look for in a healthy relationship. Oh, he's like Kevin and, Samuels. I don't know. Is does is he the guy with the long dreads? No, Kevin, he's the one that passed. He's the one that uh, had the glasses. He used to help uh, men and women with their relationships on YouTube. Yeah, I'm I'm yeah. not familiar with him. I don't yeah, think so. Same, same kind of content. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. So I just think that you have to know what your worth is. Okay. And I remember Steve Harvey saying I was at um, I was at a conference with Diana Von Zant and. And Steve Harvey came in the room and he said, you know, he said, God put everything that was worth anything uh, somewhere where you couldn't see it right away. He said he put the, um, he said the gold was in gold mines, you know, you had to beat the rock. And he said the pearls were in the oyster down at the bottom of the ocean. He said, and you know, 
he said, that thing in between your legs, <laughs> if he wanted everybody to have it, he'd put it on your shoulder. <laughs> 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 If you go around bumping all day, back head bouncing it. That's what he said. He said, he said, let me tell you something, ladies. It was about 19 of us. He said, we would do anything for that. Anything. He said, so you better recognize and don't be giving it away. You know, like it's not worth anything. You know, the temptation said, <laughs> I can turn the gray sky blue. I can make it rain whenever I want it to. Oh, I can make a castle out of single stain of grass. <laughs> I can make a ship shell on dry land. <laughs> they said, he said, I can do it all. No. I would do anything, but I can't get this to you. <laughs> 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 That's true. But, but let me ask y'all this: How and, and y'all can both answer this? At least, how, at least. Yeah. yeah. How did y'all? Um, but how do you overcome that part of it, though? Because I like, hear your stories and hear your journeys. It, it kind of doesn't sound not unique, but it, it sounds like history repeats itself. Like some of the stuff I hear going on today, I hear y'all kind of going through too. So, how do you um, overcome stereotypes, stigmas, titles? Um, and still become successful and, you know, raise your children, get married three times and, you know, still be considered successful women. Because I think that's part of it, too. Like, you know, how, how are you able to, like, break free and just live your life? Because you normally hear older women saying that they felt like they couldn't live life. And now it's starting to. It sounds like y'all live some I, life. I'm, and let me jump in one second. First of all, I think you need to learn how to take care of yourself. Pay your own bills. Mm. You know, do the things that you need to do to make you happy and not depend on another person's success to do that. Mm. I think that when you come together as a team, that you share in whatever was existing before you came together. But to just uh, to point out a person because he's got $2 and you think that's going to make you happy? No, no, ma'am. What you think? Um, I found that self-esteem has a lot to do with the decisions that you make, and not only that. Um, like I was saying in the beginning, that we never know anybody's story, their background, where they come from, what type of situation they were in. And so I'm in reflection to what the Word of God says: My people perish for lack of knowledge. And there's a lot of things that needed to be taught to us as black families and within the black family structure that we hadn't gotten. So when we get grown, our decisions are based on what we were taught when we were coming up. You know, so a lot of us go in different directions because of what we didn't know. And for myself personally, I suffered low self-esteem. That affected my decision making in everything, whether it was for myself, for my children, uh, how I was going to do for my job, my future. Everything was based on how I felt about me and how I interacted with other people. And I know it's important about who you have around in your circle, around you. I didn't know that that was important about who was around me. I'm so busy trying to be accepted. You know, I had bad people, bad influences, you know, around me. And I didn't know that they were the ones that were keeping me down because they had issues too, mm -hmm. you know. And so until you come to the light of who you are, love yourself. Because that's how uh, my marriage ended. Because I allowed a person. See, back in the day, young boys, youth, they thought, what they carried in the middle of their two legs was more important than anything else. Uh, they used to go around walking, holding it, mm -hmm. you know, like it was going to run away from them, you know, but that was, they still do. that they was still it. Do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it was going, you know, that's a precious, that was precious back then. It was really a precious thing back then, you know, and they carried it like that. They were the ones that left a lot of the women with babies. Mm -hmm. A lot of the women who got, children who were in out of wedlock were impregnated by a lot of those young men and they left them 
And so when you tell us that, oh, they're do women are doing men's jobs now, we didn't have a choice. When I came into the post office, I, I worked at the post office for 40 years. When I came into the post office, they, um, the men really didn't like the fact that I was there because why the job that I was doing, picking up boxes, um, like back in the day you had encyclopedias. It was the World Book, Britannica, whatever. So we on the truck and they put us women and men on the truck, okay, you wanna make this money, get on the truck, pick up them boxes, right? Mm -hmm. So me being a young lady, of course, I'm gonna ask a, a young man, would you help me with that? Say, no, nah, y'all want y'all women's rights, you pick it up. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you know? And so their mindset completely changed because we even fought for our rights to get a job. And if it went into a man's category, they felt like, do the job. You wanna be a man, do the job, right? So. What I had to do, I had to take on the mentality, okay, I have to be here. I have to take care of my child. I don't have anybody else to bring income. So I had to change whatever mentality I had and do whatever I had to do just to make ends meet to take care of my children. So, and I don't want to make an assumption, so I want to ask. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that, you know, if the man would have stayed, you would have liked to have been partnered? My choice of a job would have been different. Okay. The only thing that I focused on was making more money. Where I was at was going to pay me enough money plus give me benefits mm -hmm. to take care of my children. So, so women always, we were forced to have to go out and get a job that would make enough money to take care of our children. Because we weren't out there trying to get child support. If they went and they impregnated us, mm -hmm. if they stayed good, if they didn't, we gonna still move it up. We gonna still keep it moving. So, we, so and I, I love this conversation. E, you know, you did great having these folks here. Because now when I hear it, it sounds like um, we were fed a lot of propaganda, right? Because normally I've heard that same story, but the other side of the story was, well, the man wanted to be there, but the woman ran them out because they were trying to get the government assistance and the child support and the money from somewhere else. I'm not no. hearing that. I'm hearing no, that the no. men basically, just, they, they were making babies like, because what did I tell you? Yeah. In the 70s, it was a sexual revolution. Babies were being popped up everywhere. That's when they came out with birth control later on. Mm -hmm. That's when they incorporated birth control then because they were having babies like, out of wedlock like that. And there were men, young boys walking away and not taking care of their responsibility. So, like you said, some of that women's rights came from a need And so, to well, they, the women's rights was there, but mm -hmm. we were actually walking into a men, uh, you Ownership. know, men jobs, uh -huh. trying to make the money that so that we can it. make ends meet. So mm -hmm. uh, when I came to the post office, men, there were no women care, male carriers. None. So when I came in, the first rule to carrying mail on your back, you had to carry at least 60 pounds. Dang. They would take you to the scale, put the bag on my back, and keep putting the mail into the bag until it was 60 pounds. Wow. And I had to be able to carry that in or because that was one of the stipulations in order to be a mail carrier. Mm -hmm. So we did what we had to do. We had to do what we had to do, you know? So like I was telling you the example about the box with the uh, encyclopedias, in my mind, I'm going to preserve myself. So me and another young lady would just come together and we'd pick up the box together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't want to help me? I'm fine with that. Okay, me and the girls just came together and we did it together, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's been a challenge for us as women to still uh, accept the men as the men in our lives and their roles and still be able to survive past that. So um, you said you worked there for 40 years. Obviously you retired uh -huh. from the post office. I've been retired five years now. Oh, congratulations, congratulations. Thank you. Um, what did you see the transition in the workforce where it was more woman friendly versus what you experienced when the you The rules are still the same. Still the same? Yeah, if you come in, it the post office has always been a place where you look at it as a good paying job. Yeah, that's all I heard. Oh, oh, yeah, you work and, for the and good, good benefits, good, 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 good post job. office, right? Job. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's always been that. Good so benefit. as we broke the, you know, that barrier of men being mail carriers and women taking on jobs that typically a man would have, it just flowed that way. It just kept going on. Okay, you want to do this job? You do this job. So what did y'all see? Um, Cause you know another narrative we always hear is the you know war on drugs and black men were took out the home, mass incarceration. 
uh, stuff like that. What were y'all expected, a perspective based off those narratives? Well, that was true in Chicago <clears throat> as far as, and I know you all hear about Chicago. Um, literally, there were things being dropped <laughs> in Chicago, drugs, guns, you know, and those things were brought. We we never intentionally went to go get anything. They brought it to us, you know. So Chicago was just a hub for just all kind of crime, you know, where they would, uh, you would walk down the street and you would see them with, uh, what is that, RK, all those R- AK-47. AK-47. Right, they would walk down the street with that. And it was just no thing, oh, in the mid in the middle of the day, they would bust your door open and rob you. Like everything would be happening. Why? Because what would I say? People were bringing things to us so that we can destroy ourselves. Yeah. Basically, that's what they did in Chicago and still are doing it right today. What was it like in New York, Ms. Jane? We didn't. We didn't do that. First of all, they lock you up about a gun in New York. Oh yeah, well, you know, in New York, <laughs> so, guys different. Uh, you know, the only thing they was doing was selling dope in New York. You know, <laughs> but uh, folks didn't walk around with guns. Yeah. Um, but wait a minute, there was one exception. <laughs> so one day, Bumpy Johnson. Listen. Bumpy Johnson. <laughs> so one day, <laughs> I was coming out of a girlfriend's house. We were coming. We was up there doing our thing. I came downstairs and I looked up the street and I said, Carmen, that looked like two Puerto Ricans with a rifle. She said, it is. <laughs> I said, Dang. she said, come on, run. I said, girl, I'm too high. I can't run nowhere. <laughs> I said, I'm, gonna, I'm just, they're they going to go on about their business. And they did. They came up on me and pushed me in the doorway and said, give me your money. So I said, man, I don't have no money. And I went in my bra and I pulled out this one joint. <laughs> I said, this is all I have. Now, you, you want this joint? That's all I can give you. And they took my pocketbook. And when they went back down the street, they threw it. Yes, they threw it. Look, they threw it on um, my baby daddy, my youngest son's mother's porch. Threw it right on on her porch, and I got my pocketbook back. There wasn't nothing in it. What? Well, look, they didn't. There wasn't nothing. They, they, no, they left everything in it because there wasn't no money in it. Yeah. Well, when you think about the uh, Black Panthers, how they formed the, they had guns. Yeah. All of them had guns. Okay. Um, literally, when I was kids we used to hear shooting all the time the disciples we had the disciples the black panthers uh the black storm rangers all of these gangs were in chicago mm -hmm. then where did they get their guns you know so guns was just a thing that all the way the up to now appeared. you know in the magnet the magnitude of it all the way up to today that guns was always available in chicago we used to have them my mom used to make us get on the floor we hear shooting and she's get down on the floor get on the floor you know and it was just the norm you'd hear it but they would make my mom would make sure that we didn't get hit because mm -hmm. we didn't know where the shooting was going to be at but gangs was just the thing in chicago it was just what it was you know so so gangs the guns the drugs all of that was infiltrated into different neighborhoods in Chicago. Can, can you have to I remember now, question? Chicago yeah. was uh, Capone territory too. You remember yeah. they had guns and stuff yeah. like that. You know, they had no problem with coming out and shooting you with guns. So you're in the same city yeah. where Capone ruled and reigned. And then we had a mayor. Uh, his dad died and then his son took over. You know, so the Capone thing was the real. syndicate was real mm -hmm. there in Chicago. So we dealt with all of that. So so what do you think um, the issue is with our young men killing each other today in Atlanta? Well, I'm used to back in the day when you settled, they did they fist. You know, that was the way you settled. If you had aught with me, the men pulled up their fists. Right? Use these. So, so you right, live. they use their another fists. Day. You, you know, okay, let's day. get it on. You know, and then when you walked away, you know, you had settled. It was just done. 
you know, but now we at a whole different level. I just say this, I believe one thing and one thing only, I truly believe we're living in the last days because now we're living in a time where right is wrong and wrong is right. And I never thought I would be alive to see this turn of, of events that has been happening and been acceptable behavior, you know? So I don't have, I don't really have a comment on, it's sad. Because when I think about it, I think my grandchildren, and they have to live in this society. You all, the next generation now, like Eldridge and all of you all, with your children, you know, this is, it's terrible, you know. So if God, Jesus don't come back and rapture us, I just hate to see this world and where it's going to go to. <laughs> I, when I was younger, <laughs> learning about the rapture, <laughs> anytime. I wake up early and everybody, I don't hear nobody. And I see a piece of clothing on the floor. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I don't got a left in this one. That is so funny. That's yeah, fun. But um, man, one thing I will say, I love, regardless of everything that y'all been, because I can tell, we haven't got to the half of the life experiences <laughs> y'all been through. I love that y'all have always been committed to the people, your service, and then even in your latter part of your life, you committed to service to the people. It's so funny, y'all both pulled up. Both of y'all got advertisement on y'all car <laughs> for y'all organization because <laughs> y'all out here really doing the work. That's a beautiful thing. Um, when you think about access to mentorship that you all had, because one thing that I see especially when I'm dating, I have a lot of access to older guys that I that I work with, whether it was Derek Bozeman, Tony Malley Davis, Mr. Griffin, Michael Langford. I've had access to those. But I've dated women, their access is either their mom or their auntie, if it was a good relationship or if it was a dysfunctional relationship, and then their peers their age. I don't see a lot of access to women mentorship, right? So... Was it like that for y'all growing up? Did y'all have access to older women that really gave y'all the game? And do you think that's a reason why it's so different with young ladies now? They don't really have that teacher. Um, I didn't. I didn't, I mean, I didn't I either. Did, I had my mother to say, you do what I say do. Right. And that was the only mentorship right. I had. And a belt. <laughs> 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 that, that's all I had you know you don't cross this line and I'm gonna put this quarter behind this door and when I come back tomorrow it better be there you know you don't come in my house with something that I didn't pay for and that's the way I raised my kids you don't come in here if I didn't pay for it don't bring it in my house don't let the school call me about your mouth. I don't care what the teachers say to you. All right. Do not be disrespectful. Don't let me come up to that school because I didn't have to ask permission to go into the school right. during those days. So, so it, it, and is that because do women, again, it's a pattern I'm saying, right? Y'all mm. said y'all didn't have it. Is it because, you know, women, we already busy raising our own kids. We ain't got time to. Well, the reason I say I didn't have it, um, I don't know why, and I didn't reach out for it. And we didn't have the social media, the platforms that everyone have on this day. And I tell women and men all the time, you all have a well of resources. I didn't have that. When I was uh, going through domestic violence, I would call the police, and they would come out, and they would talk to my husband and then before it's all over, they're sending him back in the house with me. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, men stuck with men, bottom line. They always felt like the woman was the, it was the fault of the woman that whatever happened, even with rape. Um, after the rape, the detective gave me a card, told me if I have any more information to submit it to him. When I got more information, found out who it was, I submitted it to him. He did no follow-up. He never got to, with the guy. He didn't never come and get him. They didn't put him in jail. Because back then, men felt like you deserved 
or you did something mm -hmm. to bring about yeah. why that person did what they did to you. Mm -hmm. So for you, for them, you weren't important when it came to researching to find out who your uh, person, the person that uh, victimized you. And so I ended up still seeing this person mm -hmm. that raped me every day because a detective deemed it in, unimportant to follow up on my case. You know, so we had lived the life of not really being able to uh, depend on resources. The few, because we have very few, there's a whole lot now because I deal with that area of resources. There is an overwhelming flow of them. So I tell people, you can go <coughs> Google and find all kind for suicide, domestic violence, drug abuse, anything that you are, your controlling issues that you are dealing with, you can find some help. I let's, didn't. I wasn't able to do that. So speaking of that, because uh, I know we're getting close to that time, um, resources. Can y'all just tell about your organization, what you do, provide, and how the people can support y'all in the work that y'all doing in the community? I start you with you. Me? Yeah, I'll let you. Okay. The name of my organization is stemmed from my life experiences. Mm -hmm. Basically, most of the things that I've been through, um, I feel like most of it is what uh, most people would not have went through. So uh, I had spoke about earlier that I asked God, why did I go through the things that I went through? And that was to do what I'm doing right today. Uh, the name of my organization, again, is called the City of Hope Safe Haven. And I pretty much started off with my mission statement of catering to homelessness and transitional living folks. Um, I really wanted to be able to have a facility like a uh, brick and mortar, but I haven't been able to get that yet. But I do give a lot of resources. Um, every Wednesday, I, I also do uh, food insecurity. If you have an issue where you have aren't able to get food, I'm able to provide food every week. I give that out every week. Um, if you don't have a place to stay, I'm able to at least house you for a couple of days in a hotel. Well, we go up to from three days to a week. Um, all depends on our resources, <laughs> how much money we have, but I'm able to help them be able to get some type of services. Once we put them in the hotel, we also make sure, do a follow-up, make sure that they're good and uh, able to go to some type of resource shelter, uh, some type of place that they can be able to know that they'll have a roof over their head. Um, pretty much uh, right now, uh, we pretty much would do whatever job, uh, take care of uh, any controlling issue that you might have, counseling service. We offer a lot of wraparound services too. So if you're interested in contacting me, again, my name is Alicia Washington. Uh, you can find me on any social uh, media page. And I have a website, cityofhopesh.com, www.cityofhopesh.com. And you can find out all of the services that I have. And we'll put the links in the show notes, too, for people to just be able to click on it. Okay. All right, Ms. Jean. Well, uh, again, my name is Dr. Jean Hudley, and I'm the founder of an organization called Boys to Men and most recently rebranded Girls to Win. Uh, <clears throat> what we do is we provide uh, life skills training, anger management, conflict resolution, health and wellness, self-worth, self-esteem, etiquette, both table and cultural etiquette, and we also uh, provide technical skills through our various partnerships. Uh, we take the kids on field trips to get them out of the city. I just took 13 kids and five mentors slash trainers to Sassafras Mountain, which is on the borderline of North Carolina, and Tennessee, and we stayed there for three days. That's something that we do at least twice a year. Um, and there we teach um, self-respect uh, self skills, um, personal responsibility. Um, the kids have the opportunity to uh, participate in, in leadership programs, and so, um, uh, that's what we do in general. We went horseback riding. We also cast for a play that we're uh, performing at our yearly event. It's called Boys to Men, Sneakers and Tucks, and it's December 3rd. It's our seventh year. 
um, holiday gala. So um, that's what we do. We um, we go to another place called God's Farm, where the kids are taught carpentry, auto repair. It's on 58 acres of land where there's a full swimming pool. They have archery, a basketball court, just a host of opportunities to learn and, and play. So that's what we do. We mix learning with play. And um, again, we could be reached at boys to men, girls to win org. That's our website. Um, and um, reach out to us and you can get the other contact information, <laughs> which I'm still trying to remember. <laughs> we'll put it all again. We'll put it in the show. Name. I, I just want to personally give you ladies your flowers. Like I've seen the work uh, longer with you, Dr. Hudley, because we've been knowing each other for so long. But in this short amount of time, I just see how committed and passionate both of y'all are. I uh I honor that and I thank y'all for that and I'm here to support as always and uh like I said I do have an engaged following so preferably they will look you all up and begin to support the work that y'all are doing um thank you for sharing your stories thank um, you thank you stories so much. matter man right experiences matter uh black voices matter and I feel like you as black women seasoned black women y'all have experiences that a lot of the young ladies have not been able to hear. And they hear it from their peers. So I thank y'all for being able to come on here and be authentic, transparent about your experience. And I believe you're going to help some people today with this. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Uh, so. To my listeners, I told y'all I was going to have this interview. Quit playing with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, we just got to do it again. Yeah, yeah. This, this is part one. This is part one. Let's, thank let's, you let's so make much. another one happen. Uh, to my producer, Keith, always holding it down. To Cody the Shooter, to them young boys in the back. Yep. We see y'all. <laughs> uh, appreciate y'all. We say this every week. We love y'all. We need y'all. But most importantly, we can't wait to see y'all next week. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Just Eldridge Podcast. All right. City with T.I. Outcast. And ooh, we. Everybody know about Atlanta. It's just a cool G. Everybody know about the scammers, about the trappers. And what we living now. It's just that lifestyle. Turn on my podcast. I'm trying to hit it real now. Hear perspective. We gonna keep it real now. Every day we on the grind. Sometimes it's hard to tune out the outside. Oh, oh, oh. It's just Eldridge. It's just Eldridge. Tune in on the podcast. Tune in on the podcast. Yeah. Real things, you know we gon' laugh. Yeah. Kick it back, kick it back.